All right, hey everyone. Um, I think I know a lot of you guys here. Um, if you guys don't know me, my name is Eric Chung, co-founder of Abridge, and uh, previously I also co-founded Dapper Network. So I used to do a lot of developer boot camps for engineers who wanted to get into blockchain development with that man right there, wearing that horrible t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but today I'm just going to keep my talk short and sweet and uh, less of a technical talk because I think you guys heard a lot of, you know, you know, a lot of technical stuff. So uh, I'm going to keep it brief and a little bit more fun. Okay, this presentation is like mostly memes. So um, I'm going to be talking about incremental decentralization. This is like a product principle I think that uh, everyone is starting to realize and converge to because. Uh, You'll see in a bit. Okay, so first I'm going to start off by quickly summarizing the past, I don't know, four years of Ethereum. All right, this is kind of the mentality, right? If you build it, they will come. And we've been building a lot of cool stuff, right? The thing is, we built a lot of cool stuff, a lot of dApps, a lot of protocol stuff, infra, but the thing is, uh, sadly, nobody cares, right? And uh, there are many reasons why this is true. And, you know, by nobody, obviously everybody here cares, and that's why we're here, spending a weekend talking about Ethereum. But um, by nobody, I'm talking about just mainstream, you know, the average Joe and Jill. Right? So, some of the issues, and like, this is all everybody knows this stuff, so I'm just going to waste like the next minute of your life re summarizing what you already know. But some of the issues that we have is the cost paradox. You gotta buy ETH to use ETH, right? And to buy ETH, you gotta go to KYC and all these exchanges, like, oh, how do I know I'm not gonna lose my money, blah, blah, blah. Um, then you have default advanced mode, right? Where it's just like, immediately right when you jump into Ethereum development, is already like really difficult. There's no like on-ramp in regards to like, hey, I'm a beginner, um, can I go to Dapper Network boot camps? Well, Dapper Network's not doing boot camps anymore, so where do I go to? Can't go anywhere, right? Uh, and we have places like ETH Hub, shout out to Eric Connor, um, and like, you know, folks who are trying to make things easier, but still relatively compared to like, you know, like, what is that, like Treehouse thing where I could just learn JavaScript? Um, it's, it's, it's not as easy as that right now. Uh, we have key management problems. Uh, this has been talked about many times over and over again, uh, where if you store funds in your keys, then you lose your funds and Goodbye, trust in Ethereum, right? There goes my interest. Uh, I don't want to deal with this anymore. And finally, you have account recovery. And by the way, this is not an exhaustive list. By all means, there are many more reasons, right? Um, so just to sum it all up, Ethereum difficulty is too damn high. And um, again, like I don't want a blanket statement and say like it's still damn difficult because you know when I started getting into Ethereum in 2016, uh, that was difficult. Now it's like a piece of cake compared to that. But for the average user, it's still pretty damn difficult. So um, I think the root cause, or you know, a lot of the reasons kind of stem from this. Right? We have this vision of what Ethereum can do, and a lot of the benefits kind of come from this decentralization mindset. Um, the thing is like users, or you know, the end users, I mean like we know it ourselves, right? Whenever we're using an app, if it makes our lives better, you know, we're doing something faster, cheaper, then we care to like keep coming back and using these apps. But uh, at the moment, because we understand, like we as in like we, the people in this room, and then like them as the people outside of this room, um, you know, like we have this vision of how, what Ethereum can achieve with the benefits of decentralization. Other people don't get it or don't have the opportunities to get it, but we're like, eat this broccoli, it's good for you, right? Um, so. Uh, it's really hard to kind of like allow people to gently kind of get into the space and realize the benefits of decentralization on their own uh, because we're just shoving it down their throats. So if that's the case, um, then maybe we should think about it differently, right? And this is more of the product development side of things. Um, in for guys, you guys do what you gotta do. Um, but more on the DAP layer, right? Decentralization of fundamental features should be positively correlated to the user's comfort with Web3. And, you know, not many people are comfortable uh, with this, like, brand new, you know, version of the web right off the bat. You can't, like, assume that of people. Otherwise, it's not fair. You're not giving them a chance to, like, kind of come to these realizations on their own. So, if that's the case, 
then uh, what should we do about this? And that brings me to incremental decentralization. It's in the name, right? How do we incrementally decentralize um, features in a way where the user experience is still very pleasant, it's on par with Web2 apps, but they're able to kind of like realize the benefits of uh, decentralization. A couple of things. Um, I made a blog post about this on Medium, so if you guys haven't seen it, go check it out. Um, just Google incremental decentralization, it'll probably come up. Um, but the first thing is probably minimum viable trust. This is probably like the cornerstone idea of you know this product philosophy, um, where users are able to opt into decentralization at their own convenience. Keywords at their own convenience, right? We don't shove broccoli down people's throats just because they need more veggies, right? But we uh, we coax them and say, hey, don't you want a healthier life? Like maybe you look at this person who's fit and blah blah blah. And you know, you like you, you kind of like package it up in a way where the users, at their own convenience, are able to come to you and be like, hey, I heard about this decentralization thing. Um, I want to learn about it more. So what this means is that when you start building dApps, uh, you know, you should definitely incorporate some decentralization aspects into it because otherwise, how will they ever kind of like, how will that spark ever kind of like cross their minds? But do it in a way where, you know, they don't have to engage in this maximalist decentralization like ethos, like we're already kind of familiar with. So minimum viable trust, um, everything else, just leave it centralized. Radical, right? <laughs> okay, um, so kind of like going further, multiple graded entry points, um, kind of like a long phrase, really just what it means is that users are able to level up uh, through whatever incentivization mechanisms you have in your app so that you know they can self-educate themselves as they explore your app, you know, explore your product value, and then they're like, oh shoot, this might actually be better if you know this little bit was also decentralized. Um, then you know users are able to uh, level up as they use your app, not like right off the bat, but they're experiencing your product, they're using it, they're becoming you know, believers and evangelists eventually of your app. So uh, giving them opportunities. And, you know, we have all of this, like this entire new field of token economics. Um, I kind of think of those as like actively designing uh, incentives. But if you do something like, like passive incentives where, um, for example, um, a bridge has this concept called account contracts. And what account contracts do is, uh, we have smart contract wallets, but because they're kind of factually instantiated, uh, it removes a need for a user to um, pay for gas in order to access or to receive funds right off the bat. Now, then you'll probably go like, well, if it's kind of factually instantiated, you probably need to deploy your contract. Then the user needs to see the gas, right? But if you could imagine a scenario where you know somebody is playing a game, let's say, um, let's say you built this game and your user has onboarded through these counterfactually instantiated account contracts, you know, they're able to put in work into your game whatever mechanics you've designed for a user, and as they add value to your game and the network uh, behind it, then let's say they're accruing funds, right? Like I won something and then I, I don't know, I get like two bucks. Uh, well, two bucks is more than enough to deploy your contract. So, you know, you kind of have these like passive incentives where it's like, you tie your product value directly to uh, all these like decentralization benefits that you're baking into your app. Uh, corollary to that is uh, user-initiated exits. Now this is on the flip side. Centralization is acceptable if users have self-custody or full custody of their funds and can exit any time. So for example, um, you know, we run a demo all the time whenever we uh, show somebody new who's like, what's a bridge? Uh, where we use like an entire AWS backend where we manage user info and all that stuff. So it's like, oh shoot, Amazon is evil, they're centralized, um, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, you know, with the account contracts, because these contracts are, you know, the users have generated these account contracts, they're like, whenever funds are sent to these contracts, they have self-custody. So that means that regardless of whether or not AWS goes down or we decide to like, shut down somebody's account, uh, at the end of the day, your user still has a fund. So 
That's what I mean by self-custody, and they can exit at any time, right? They're not bound by like some vendor lock-in. For example, like Coinbase does a really good job of UX, right? However, uh, it's not custodial, or it is custodial, so that means that you cannot just retrieve the private keys and exit at any time. So although they do a great job of onboarding users into the ecosystem, you can't exit. Or at least it's not initiated by the users. So giving them freedom and the agency to exit at any time. Finally, all this kind of leads into, okay, like how do you actually achieve these stuff? Um, and I think uh, the reason why we're at state of scale is because you know, layer two is becoming increasingly on uh, you know, the radar of a lot of projects uh, because if you do a layer two first design, uh, you can actually do a lot of things um, that mimic you know, the flow of web two worlds so that you can bring people in. Um, and if I were to summarize that into one sentence, I would say right now there's a lot of focus on on-chain activity, right? You have Etherscan, Amber Data, blah, blah, blah. Like all these other projects kind of like looking at on-chain stuff. Um, but once you have layer two kind of taken off, especially with like Seller just coming out on mainnet and we have, you know, Connects and uh, all these other projects, uh, off-chain transactions I think is going to be as important, if not more important in the DAP narrative than on-chain transactions. If you believe that, then that means that you probably want to design your user experience around layer two design because it's very different from when you're doing on-chain designs, right? You don't have to deal with all these MetaMask pop-ups and um, actually it depends on how you design it, but you know. Uh, you don't have to deal with as mid, like, uh, like all of the on-chain things that like require a user on the UI to like show them whatever, um, you can get rid of all that because you now have, you know, for example, state channels running in the background. So, to summarize my short talk, um, it's kind of like this, right? Oh, I left out a bit of text. On the left side, you have cake. You could be the best baker in the world, right? And by baker, if you don't get it, you guys are the bakers, the developers, right? You could be the best baker in the world building the best apps, but you make a cake like this, I bet you like most of us will look at it and it's like, eh, it looks all right, and just keep walking away, right? Uh, but with something like incremental decentralization where you kind of prettify the user flow so that it's more in, uh, like uh, exciting and like friendly for me to engage, then, you know, you apply incremental decentralization, it looks like this. You get frosting, you get like, you know, nice eyebrows and this unicorn horn and it's like, oh wow, that looks like a delicious cake, right? So kind of tying it all back in. You can build the best apps, but if it doesn't look good to your users, or friendly, or safe, then it doesn't matter because like, they're not gonna taste it. They're not gonna know how great your app is. Um, so, this is my talk about incremental decentralization. Oh, there we go. <laughs> this is my talk about incremental decentralization, and um, just really briefly, uh, I'll go through how a bridge is kind of like allowing you to do this. Um, so I'm gonna quickly go through. So if you guys were able to get a chance to look at the documentation uh, that I wrote up last night, <laughs> uh, if you go into the playground tab, uh, we have a couple of flows that you can do with the abridged SDK. And the cool thing is that you don't need to install this on your machine if you just kind of want to dabble with it, because we have a playground uh, that exposes all of the SDK methods uh, visually in this uh, Laker-themed UI. <laughs> because we're in LA. So, um, let's run through some of this. We'll, we'll go through like the first two. Um, so, setting up an account, and by account I'm talking about account contracts. If you go to this playground, uh, now, what has happened, oh, uh, you know what? I've already done this, so let me reset this. Okay. <clears throat> so, all of these things on the left are like stuff that our SDK can do, and you just gotta click buttons to actually like test it out. Um, don't worry about it if like it looks scary with the code. Um, just watch what I'm doing, and then follow it along on Gitbook afterwards. So, creating an account. Um, this is generating a counterfactual account contract. 
And um, you know what you would do is like you would tie it into let's say a, like a username password you know onboarding flow on the UI, and then once the user clicks that button, it also calls its method, and then you generate an account under the hood without them ever seeing anything and uh, without having to deal with gas, at least not in front. So let's see a state of scale. So this is a. Uh, we're attaching an ENS label, or ENS name, to the account contract. Okay, and of course it doesn't work. Already taken. Oh, somebody's are, who messed around with this? Okay, I'll just do a random one. Okay, here we go. So now I just created an account contract. And if you look at the details here that it prints out, you know, the state is created, which means you've just generated an account contract. This is a real wallet, it's on chain. Like you guys can send funds to this um, on Robston and I'll receive it. Um, now, obviously what you wanna do is you wanna deploy this, right? Or at least on behalf of your user, probably use something like a meta transaction uh, relayer network so that you know when they receive funds then you can automatically go and deploy it so I'm gonna have to do it manually because I'm not engaging in an app so let me go into Robston grab this I know it's like we're trying to get rid of MetaMask but I gotta use MetaMask to do this just shoot over one ETH Let's just say it, you know, this user acquired one ETH by like winning a game or something. Okay, now we have one ETH here, and you can see how everything is conveniently like you know visualized. Now I'm just gonna go over to deploy account. There's no fancy like method names. It's all in plain English. Deploy account. Hit that run button. We gotta run the estimation because you gotta estimate your you know deployment costs. And then I'm just gonna hit deploy account. Oh. So now, what we can do is I can plug this into Etherscan. Where is the network? Is it on more? And you guys will see in just a sec that this is literally how easy it can be for a user to now have access to an account contract. This is a smart contract based wallet and cool. Now let me switch back to the playground real quick. Now you can see here the account state has been deployed. So you know, it took a little bit of gas so that you could deploy it, and now you could actually mess around with this and like run all these transactions that you want to do as a user uh, and interact with Web3. So here we go, it's all on chain, and that is how easy it is. Two SDK methods, boom, you plug it into your onboarding flow, and your user now has entered the crypto ecosystem without seeing anything um, to hinder them of like, oh shoot, what is like this Web3 stuff? So uh, I'll just stop there. There's like a lot of cool stuff that you can do. Um, but if you guys have any like technical questions, our tech whiz is outside, James Young, go find him. Uh, we also have a bunch of teams who have used our SDK uh, to some degree or another. Like we have a team from Australia, Flexstabs. We have Ethereum team with Chris um, and a bunch of others who have already like, you know, messed around with our SDK. So uh, if any of this stuff is exciting to you, please come talk to me or uh, the rest of the bridge team. Duncan's right here, uh, getting James outside. And yeah, incremental decentralization. I think it's gonna catch on. So it's, I just gotta find a better name for it. It's too long. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's it. So thank you guys.